from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. I hope you've brought your Bibles because we want to talk about a very important subject today. The judgment of God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. Not the end of the world. There's not going to be an end of the world. But there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end. And Christ the Messiah is going to come back. We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter in your Bibles comes right after 1 Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live under serious temptation now, our trial now. God knows how to deliver you if you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral saturated body of water which is 1260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, or if you want to go across the Jordan and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go. We've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family, and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. 
The Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course. But at that time, it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today, the word Sodom is used to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now, what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now, in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now, the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter. When he says that, they had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They lived for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool has said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God, and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21, it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers of, or thieves, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent toward Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. 
but the powers of evil will overcome you and you will die before your time and be lost from God. In Jude, the 12th verse, it says, there are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. How many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we've forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed. Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1, it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now, God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? Then after a while, he said 30, then 20. Finally, he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority. A minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back. If you did look back, 
you'd be turned to a pillar of salt. Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. Many of us look longingly at the world, and many are like Demas, having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now, the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ. Because the scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom. And evil and the devil are going to be eliminated. And this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and the, all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world. God so loved this present world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that includes you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. Well, how will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God, what trump that'll, trumpets that'll be. Now, it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you, if you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that. That's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow. And he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins and you're not sure that you've repented? To surrender totally to Christ? Your heart, your mind, your body, your life so that Christ is first in your life. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. 
Get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay because he says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are, God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in, you come and join them. Television, here in this great Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, where three rivers come together right here. You have heard the message, and God has spoken to you, and we've seen hundreds of people come here, many more hundreds on the way. You can make your commitment to Christ where you are. You can say yes to Christ. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and give you a new life. Let him come into your heart right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I do repent of my sins as best I know how. I'm not sure that I know how, but Lord, help me to repent. And help me to believe, Lord. I need your help even in the believing. And help me to follow you and serve you. He'll help you. If you make that commitment, call that number on the screen. Now we're going to wait for others that are still coming down the aisles. There's still time for you to make that important decision. Take a moment right now to call the number on your screen. Someone will pray with you and talk with you about your spiritual condition and the hope and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Call right now. This concludes our spring television series. We're so glad you joined us. Just before we leave you for this time, we want to remind you to pray for Billy Graham and the team as we prepare for special meetings in Cleveland, Ohio, and Atlanta, Georgia in the days ahead. Now for Billy Graham and the entire team, this is Cliff Barrow saying goodbye, and may God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want to read a passage of scripture that was on the cake that they presented to my oldest grandson the day that he was confirmed. And this was on the cake. It was third epistle of John, the fourth verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Of course, John was talking about those young converts of his that he called his children but here we could apply it to our families and to our own children you know the other night a 20 year old couple got married on friday night in ohio they came to toronto on their honeymoon attended the crusade tuesday night and responded to the invitation to receive jesus christ and the counselor said the husband immediately started taking his role as the spiritual leader of the home 
because he said, we're going to get into the Word of God. And the counselor added, what a wedding present that was. There was a man here the other night who is one of the chief karate instructors in South Africa on his way home to Johannesburg. And after taking some refresher classes in Japan, he stopped here for two days. He attended the crusade, accepted Christ as his savior. 41 years old, he said, I'm rushing back to Johannesburg to tell my wife and family that I have found Jesus Christ. And we've had story after story, and if I'd had time tonight, I was going to tell you some more stories of people that have found Christ here in this tremendous crusade here in Toronto during these days. But I want to get quickly to what makes up a happy home or how you can have an, a, the right kind of a home. And the first point that I would like to make is that God performed the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. And it was God's idea to have a family in the first place. Before the cities and governments, written language, before nations, temples, churches, there were families. And the family is the most important institution in the world. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed was at a wedding at Cana of Galilee. And Jesus was underscoring the importance of the home because if the home goes, the nation is going to go. It was my privilege the other day to talk to the prime minister of this country and today to the premier of Ontario. And in, on both occasions, it was interesting how we got to this idea of how the home is a basic unit and the home cannot be separated from the health of the nation or of the province. Many today are wringing their hands with fear and insecurity. But more important than what happens at Wall Street or what happens at the United Nations is what is happening to our families. In the home, character is formed. Integrity is born. Values we live by are made clear. Goals are set. Attitudes are formed that last a lifetime. Is your home built on a solid foundation? That's the question I want to ask. Remember the man Jesus told about that built his house on a rock? Is your house built on a rock? Is your home secure tonight? Or is it filled with tension? Is it about ready to break up? We've had more couples come forward here that were living together without marriage or more couples come forward here that have been separated and more couples that have been divorced that have come here together and be reunited than almost any crusade we've held in a long time. And it indicates to me that this is a growing problem in Toronto and it's a growing problem in this part of Canada as well as in the United States and other parts of the world. The third point I'd like to make is that our modern life puts tremendous pressures on the home and the family. You know some of the pressures that the home faces today. It reminds me of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, where the scripture says there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build a wall. And we see rubbish everywhere. Rubbish on television and in films and in magazines. Making fun of the home, making fun of marriage, making light of one of the holiest of all institutions, the marriage. And God has indicated from one end of the word to the other that when the home fails, the society is going to fail. And I tell you this, unless we have a spiritual revival and our homes are renewed, the nation is going to be destroyed. There's no way that we can escape the judgment of God unless we come back to Christian or to God-fearing home. You know, we're living in cities today. All over the world, people are moving to cities. As a boy on the farm, I could watch my father work and was made part of that work. Today, a man goes to work in a factory on office and his wife goes off to work too. And often the children never see either one of them doing their jobs and they never become a part of it. In small rural communities of yesterday, everyone knew everyone. Teachers and parents were friends. But the working mother or the two-career family is already upon us. And many times 
It's impossible to escape it because of taxes and because of inflation and all the rest of it. In order to make a living, both parents have to work in many instances. But Ezekiel 16 says, as is the mother, so is her daughter. As is the mother, so is her daughter. Which indicates that we as parents are to set the example in front of our children of Bible reading, of prayer, of integrity, of truthfulness, of honesty, and let them see in us Jesus Christ. Because one could say, as the father, so the son, as well as the mother and her daughter. And we have that responsibility as Christians. But we're glorifying today not getting married. I read the other day that 1,500,000 couples are living together in the United States without any intention of ever getting married. And the number of those getting married is decreasing and the number of divorces is mounting until one of our so great sociologists said recently at Columbia University that we may not have any homes at all by the end of this century. It may be something of the past. And sex is now treated by many like a physical appetite to be satisfied completely apart from any meaningful relationship. Just like you go out and buy a hamburger to satisfy your appetite. So you go out and have sex. That's not what God meant it to be at all. It's a holy gift from God to be used within matrimony. But there's a satanic attack on the family today. Even Christian families are feeling it. I've never heard so many stories of Christian families even having so much tension and so much difficulty. We've never had more books on the bookshelves telling us how to solve our family problems or sexual problems than we have today. And yet somehow we're more miserable, we're more broken, we're more torn, we're more hurt than we've ever been. Why? Because we have not taken the Word of God into account because God has laid down the rules and the regulations for a successful and happy home. And we've broken them. We thought we could do it some other way and we found that we failed. Let's come back to the Bible. Let's come back to the Word of God and build our homes on this book and the God that performed the first marriage. The fourth point I would like to make is that the family is still the most durable institution in the world. Historically, the family has survived all attacks. But many today want love without commitment. The latest polls indicate that young people may be turning back toward the family relationships and commitments, and it's most encouraging. Perhaps the tide is beginning to turn. I pray that it will be. I believe it is beginning to turn in the United States. And I'm happy to see it because, you see, even in Russia and China where they profess atheism, they're finding they cannot build a strong society without a home. They experimented at first without homes. They laughed at marriage, but now they've changed their minds. And then the fifth thing I'd like to say is the family needs help and encouragement. God is interested in your family, your marriage, your children. He shows us the ideals and the goals for the family, and He's willing to help us. Ezra said, Then I proclaimed a fast there to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones. Seeking God's will for your family. That's what Ezra was doing, seeking the will of God for his family. Have you sought God's will? Have you gotten on your knees and committed your children to the Lord time after time? Do you gather them together for family devotions? Or are you too embarrassed to? Or too hypocritical to? What keeps you from doing it? Because it's been proven statistically that the homes that have Bible reading and prayer and go to church every Sunday, there's only one divorce in 400 marriages. 
while the national average in the United States is now almost one out of every two marriages? The answer is God. The answer is spiritual. The answer is surrendering your heart and your life to Jesus Christ as parents, as children, so that every member of the home knows Jesus Christ and loves the Word of God. And then the next point I would like to make is that the husband-wife relationship is the key to the family's success. Nearly all the psychologists or sociologists that I've talked to and books that I've read indicate that the home will only rise so high as the husband-wife relationship. The children seeing love between the husband and the wife. You see, many people get married without any idea of how much is at stake and laying the foundation for failure in the very beginning in courtship. You be careful who you go with and fall in love with. Be sure that he or she is God-fearing and loves Christ. The Scripture says, Be not unequally yoked together. How many of you have tried it and failed? There must be a spiritual oneness. There are three people that make up a marriage, the husband, the wife, and God. And be sure God is in your marriage. You see, so many are marrying someone with whom they have a very little chance of having a successful marriage. Seventeen magazine made a survey some time ago of young men and they asked the young men many questions and one of the questions was, what do you want your girlfriend to have on the first date? And the number one answer was a good figure. I would say the number one answer as far as I'm concerned would be to love the Lord with all her heart and all her mind. Many marry without being aware of the ideals and the goals which God has set for marriage. You see, God planned marriage for people with some maturity. Now, you can be mature when you're 17. You can be mature when you're 18, and you can be absolutely immature at 40. I see some little teenage 40-year-olds trotting around. And there are many of them. The Scripture says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. You must be people who are ready to emotionally leave home. Now you think about that. We're always to love our parents. I don't care where you go to the ends of the earth. You're to love your parents. You're to confer with your parents. You're to honor your parents. You're to enjoy your parents. But when you get married, you must realize that they can never, that you can never again depend on them as you did when you were little children. Many parents ruin the marriage of their children by refusing to turn them loose. Learn when to turn them loose. For this cause shall a man leave, and his wife must be first, the husband must be first, while still honoring and loving and seeking the advice and the counsel of the parents. And the parents must learn how to turn loose. And when you turn them loose, I'm going to tell you something. When you turn them loose, they'll come back to you closer than ever as adults. And you'll enjoy them as much as you ever did. And then God wants marriages to be permanent until death do us part. Many people enter the marriage vow without any idea that this is for keeps. A young man at the marriage altar thinking to himself, if this doesn't work out, I'll get a divorce. Yes, tensions are going to come. There's going to be that adjustment period, and you keep adjusting the rest of your life. There'll be problems. There'll be disagreements. But you're to accept each other's faults. Your wife is not perfect and your husband is not perfect. You found that out 
after about two days. That first morning you saw her in curlers. And that first morning when she saw, saw you get up bleary eyed. And it's not always romantic. But we are to be together in a relationship that God has formed. We become one flesh. And many people that have been married for many years have loved each other so much and been together so much and know each other so well that they begin to look like each other. That's actually true. People tell me that I look like Ruth. If that's true, I'm getting mighty good looking. And I'll tell you, when I haven't seen her in two weeks, she looks better than ever. <laughs> but there must be a lifetime commitment when you come to Christ. It's forever. Repeat it to yourself. Forever, forever, forever. Till death do us part. Don't ever entertain the idea of separation and divorce. If you know Christ, He can hold you together. There is no problem that you face that cannot be solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God's ideal is for the husband and the wife to be faithful to each other. Faithful to each other. I read the other day that 70% in a survey, 70% of the men's it indicated were cheating on their wives. I just can't believe that statistic. I, I cannot allow myself to believe it. It didn't say how many wives cheated on their husbands. But I want to tell you, the Bible calls it adultery. And the Bible says that no adulterer will be in heaven. We don't realize what a vile and terrible thing it is to break the marriage vow with that type of a sin. I know it's old-fashioned. I know that's out of date. But that's the teaching of the Word of God, and the Word of God never, 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 never changes. It's the same. God hasn't changed in all these centuries. Do you think that God is changing His whole nature to accommodate Himself to your sins? No. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the same God that hated the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, hate the sins that we're committing today in the countries of the world that I travel in because it's worldwide. To have an affair is said to put uh, spice in a marriage. I read that the other day in some newspaper. It's a sin against God and it breaks the marriage vow. And many of you are asking, well, what can I do to help my marriage? The first step is to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Let Him come into your life. You say, well, how do I do that? We've seen hundreds and even thousands here in Toronto come to Christ. Be willing to repent of your sins. That's the first step. Realize that God loves you. In spite of your sins, in spite of your failure, He loves you and He's willing to forgive you, but you must be willing to repent. And that word repent means to change. Change your mind. Change the direction of your life and determine that you're going to bring your life under the Lordship of Christ. If you failed in the home, if you failed at being a parent, if you failed at being a husband or a wife or an obedient child in the home, Surrender your life to Christ tonight and let him come into your heart and help you to be the right kind of a husband or wife or the right kind of a child. We had a man come forward in Las Vegas to make his commitment to Christ and he and his wife were in the divorce courts. And he called her on the phone and he said, I'd like to come and see you said, I'd like to settle this divorce business. And she didn't know what he meant. And so they got together and they went to the little restaurant where they'd been before. And they fell in love all over again. They called their lawyers and said, call it off. 
we're being reunited in Christ. That can happen to you. Maybe you and your wife haven't separated, but spiritually you're separated. Emotionally you may be separated, psychologically separated. Let Christ come in and bring you together. And then our children need help. Our children need help. They need your love. You know, I heard a psychiatrist say many years ago that helped me. They said, you know, your children may come to a point where they do rebel because most children come to a point where they're seeking their own identity and, and they may rebel for three or four years or five years, a little bit. Maybe some of them wildly rebel. This psychiatrist said, let them know that you disapprove, but that you love them. And when they come through that point of rebellion, and when they find their own identity, the love will still be there. Let the love of Christ dominate your family, dominate your relationships within the family, and you can have a wonderful home. It's not too late to repair it. It's not too late to change. You can start tonight. What do you have to do? Be willing to repent of your sin and receive Christ by faith into your heart. Notice I said by faith. You may not understand it all. You may not understand what I mean when I say accept Christ by faith. You don't have to understand it all. Come by simple childlike faith, like a little child is trusting his father. You trust the heavenly father. Put your hand in his hand tonight and say, tonight, I want Christ. You see, he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He rose again from the dead, and he's alive, and the Bible says he's coming back again. You believe that and accept that, and that he's willing to come by the Holy Spirit and live in your heart tonight, right now. You don't have to live the Christian life alone. You don't have to be that husband alone or that wife alone or that child alone or that teenager alone. Christ will come into your heart right now tonight if you'll let him. And on this wet, damp, cold evening, what a wonderful moment to let Christ come into your own heart and you become the right kind of a husband, the right kind of a wife, the right kind of a son or daughter. I'm going to ask you to receive him right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come out here on this field and stand here as a moment of recommitment or a moment of receiving Christ, whatever your reason for coming. You may be a member of the Anglican Church or the United Church or the Pentecostal Church or the Catholic Church, or you may not have any religious background. I don't know who you are, but I'm going to ask you to come and say tonight, I want Christ in my heart. I want him to be my Lord and my master and my savior. And I want to go back and be the right kind of a husband and the right kind of a wife. I want him to forgive my past. I want him to change me. I want to be the right kind of a young person in the home. I've been rebellious against my parents and I haven't lived a Christian life in the home, but I want to from this moment on. You may be here with your fiance or your sweetheart and you want to dedicate your lives together to Christ. You come. As people are already coming, you get up and come right now. No one leaving. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that have been watching by television can see now that God has been wonderfully working and that you can come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Right now, accept Him. And if you'll make that commitment, we'll send you the same literature we're going to give the people here. 
Many hundreds and thousands of people have come to Christ here in Toronto, Ontario, and you can come to Christ where you are. Give your life and your heart to him right now. God help you to make that commitment tonight. In, go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for